Hello everyone and welcome again to another episode of Letter of Law Interviews. My name is Sarthak Bharadwaj and in today's episode I am absolutely thrilled, delighted, excited, honored and so joyed to be in conversation with none other than Mr. Sanjoy Ghosh. Sir of course doesn't require any introduction. He's a designated senior advocate, a published author and Twitter's favorite celebrity lawyer. So so first of all a very warm welcome to you on the show thank and you, thank you so thank much you, for having me it's a privilege and an honor <laughs> no thank you so much sir in fact uh, like i was telling you before we started recording uh, when i started this podcast it was like a long standing desire of mine to feature you on the podcast and today i'm speaking with you so that's really i mean it's it's a great day for me and for the podcast and sir i'd like to start with your new profession and career as a published author of how gorongo lost his o a fascinating book that i'm reading presently so sir, how has life been i mean now that you're a published author are you happy with the kind of reception <laughs> the book has received well i am quite overwhelmed frankly satak by the response it was actually it started as a pandemic coping strategy you know uh, being a government lawyer all of a sudden we were we were jobless uh, this was march 2020 you know 23rd march onwards and suddenly we realized you know what do you do with the time because you were so used to you know as lawyers as litigators we value our time according to the cases we are doing the running around we are doing you know we are not used to sitting in a stationary a sedentary position so it was uh, you know it was like almost like therapy that i started writing first as an autobiography and then i realized i hit a block so i said why why not write fiction and it was more of coping and as i as as many people say when is the sequel coming and i tell them you know wait for another pandemic what for me so uh, uh, you know for me i feel the book almost wrote itself so uh, uh, you know uh, it's it's still to sink in you know uh, that it happened and and even now after you know it this came out in may even now i get these messages on uh, twitter direct messages emails people uh, just uh, two days back uh, a lawyer caught me in the in the in the high court and said i have presented i'd like to so much i presented it to my juniors and he got the juniors with the book to get them autographed so it's it's you know i'm truly blessed <laughs> oh that's wonderful so does that ever make you feel like a oh, little celebrity to have people rush to you for autographs and things like that <laughs> <laughs> no no not at all it it's actually quite embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> oh, no but but sir actually i'm curious uh, this fine gentleman at the back has a hairstyle that quite resembles uh, loosely to the one that you are donning at the moment so for the readers it's quite obvious that the lo- the story is loosely based around your character is that <laughs> is that <laughs> well those who know me know that uh, you know boris johnson and i have only one thing in common bad hair <laughs> <laughs> and in fact uh 10 days back the chief justice of the delhi high court pulled me up for my my hair being in a disheveled style state so uh, you know <laughs> this is a problem that i have i just can't get my hair in order <laughs> you know, so your hair looks but, quite fancy and it's a wonderful hairstyle but sir, but uh, sorry sorry no no go please ahead. go on sir no no i was saying but but these illustrations were done by this uh, by this artist and when my editor supriya uh, she actually took the initiative to get this cover done i was frankly today i realize in in hindsight it's very catchy you know mm, everyone is. Uh, is finding this cover very catchy but my first reaction was one of shock and i said that look i thought i wrote a very serious book <laughs> with a lot of pathos a lot of sadness a lot of emotion and what is this cartoon cover that you made <laughs> <laughs> I, i and like a true lawyer i said that you know your readers are going to sue you saying that you misled them <laughs> No, but but I must confess, sir. I saw this book at Bharisans in Khan Market, and its cover is so catchy. the The attention immediately goes towards it. But again, I'd ask the readers to not judge the book by its cover. The cover is very fanciful, and the story is as engaging as the cover is. So before we start, the book is available on EBC, on Amazon, in your nearest bookstores. So rush, get a copy for yourself, for your parents, for your teachers, for everyone, and gift it across. The holiday season is upon us. So now sir to start with the interview this is a question that perhaps everyone on twitter and anyone who knows you and has interacted with you has on their mind why does mr sanjoy ghosh a senior advocate call himself a struggling lawyer <laughs> well you know uh, uh, why i started off uh, let me give you a little history on this because this is uh, this is very interesting uh 
I got on Twitter in 2010, but I was really not active until 2019, 20. It was just like a dormant account. And uh, then I understood the grammar of Twitter because I actually felt that, you know, in the bar, there are very few people who are speaking up for issues of judicial independence, uh, uh, of executive overreach um, and the violation of fundamental rights of people. And I felt that as in the bar, there's so much of silence and someone has to speak. And I had used the word, uh, the term, the you know, the uh, the Twitter bio, as they say, struggling lawyer in 2010. And by the time I actually became active, I was a standing counsel of the Delhi High Court. That is the High Court's own lawyer. I was an st additional standing counsel of the Delhi government. Uh, and uh, I was pretty senior in the, I wasn't a designated senior advocate then, but I was pretty senior. But I did not feel the need to actually, uh, uh, you know, write all of that, like many people write. And in fact, Sartak, this was an insurance for me. So mm -hmm. when the people would troll me, imagine if I had written I was Arvind Kejriwal's government's lawyer, you know, you know, the kind of reaction I would get from the Twitter trolls right. or the Delhi High Court's lawyer or a pretty senior lawyer. So all the maximum uh, trolling I would get is, is <laughs> <laughs> So then, uh, so then when I was designated, uh, a lot of people said, oh, now you should write senior advocate, etc. But then I found a new flip to it. And I said that struggle here, it should not be seen as only financial struggle. The struggle, we all should be strugglers. The day we give up our struggle, the day that our fight is lost for justice. Absolutely. So this struggle is a struggle to always maintain your independence, to maintain your principles and never sacrifice or compromise with your ideals. So that is the struggle. So therefore, I'm always a struggling lawyer and will always remain so. <laughs> oh, well said, sir. In fact, there's a friend of mine who says to me, the struggle is sacred. And that's that's really wonderfully put. Uh, very, well, so, very well put. So, uh, sir, coming, I was actually listening to another interview of yours where you say, where someone asked you, has your Twitter popularity led to an influx of clients? But you said that this one time a client asked you to remove the term struggling lawyer because they wanted to get clients and the client was worried that why is he writing a struggling lawyer in your profile? So uh, what's your... Right, sorry, 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 I, I interrupted you. Yeah, so my just my question is, how does your Twitter profile, you know, where you're completely unabashed and you speak whatever comes to your mind, how does that affect your relationship with your clients and the briefing councils? Well, I have been told by many briefing lawyers. In fact, I was a briefing lawyer came today to uh, to brief me in a matter before a judge, and he said, "Oh, you in Twitter, you are taking him left, right, and center." But the but the but the good part is that still he feels confident in briefing me. Uh, the point which I'm making is that uh, yes, I've had many people who've told me that tone it down. You're a senior. Uh, uh, you know, you've lost so many people because you are so uh, open with your uh, with your thoughts with your uh, with your viewpoints but I, I i honestly feel that at the end of the day uh i have uh, not in fact compromised what i believe in and i believe that just because i am outspoken on twitter doesn't make make me any any different right. it is just that the it's the it's the times sadly it's the times that very few people are outspoken in fact, if by by my example, and there are many of uh, many of the young lawyers who are also taking it up, being outspoken about the independence of the judiciary, then good. Then I don't mind sacrificing uh, uh, you know uh, big cases, etc. I am doing fine. I have enough uh, uh, you know practice to take care of me, my body and my mind. That's enough. Right. But as long as whatever I do can help, the in whatever little way you know, I, I don't have that's such a big idea of myself, but as a as a small contribution, if I can do something for the institution, which has given me so much, you know, I have got a lot from this institution and I'm very loyal to the judiciary. So if my, uh, you know, comments should not be seen as disrespecting the judiciary or attacking the judiciary, my comments should be seen as someone who's really, really concerned to ensure that we we have to protect our judges we have to protect the bar we have to ensure that we stand up for justice because at the end of the day in a democracy we are the most important uh, pillar uh, of justice you know people normally, normally talk about executive legislature and judiciary but it is the legal community it's the bar which stands up ultimately you see you see what is happening in gujarat right now it is a bar which is standing up for the independence of the judiciary and and you know the comment that you made about uh, whether the Twitter popularity is leading to cases, in fact, is leading to a lot of discontent because a lot of people send me direct messages uh, sharing their legal problems. 
and ask me uh, answers. And I have to tell them that under the bar council rules, as a senior advocate, I can't directly interact with uh, with uh, clients, and that they have to approach me through lawyers, and they're pretty disappointed because many of them are hoping for a you know free, quick uh, you know solution to their problems. So that's the that's a difficulty when you ethically practice. You have to follow the rules. Mm, no, absolutely right and well put. Thank you for stating that, sir, in such clear terms. So moving on, I'd like to get to know a little bit more about your legal journey. And I'd love to start from your time at NLS. What was it like to be a law student back in the 90s? I mean, today, no matter which law school one goes to, the challenges and difficulties remain the same. Everyone is trying to intern all year round, trying to publish papers, do moots, and hope that at the end of a grueling five-year period, we'll have like a high corporate job waiting for us or a well-respected senior chamber to join. But what was it like for you back in those days in the 90s to be a law student? Well, uh, to, you know, I've said this before also, and, you know, close your eyes and imagine a world where the Soviet Union still existed, where Gorbachev still existed. Imagine a world where apartheid was still there. Imagine a world where there was no internet. Imagine a world where there were no computers. Imagine a world uh, where still you had uh, uh, the Cold War going. And that's the time when we went to law school in 91. In fact, the coup removing Gorbachev happened while we were in the first trimester of law school. So we are that ancient. And in fact, our fees were 750 rupees for every three months, trimesters as we followed in the law school. Right. So at that stage, actually, and you know, I gave you political uh, uh, landscape. Look at the judicial landscape. Imagine uh, when I went to law school, there was no Arbitration Act of 1996. Right. There was no Companies Act of 2013. There was no IBCs. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the focus. So it was, you know, it, life was simpler. And in fact, for whatever it be, everyone bought into this. Uh, our director, uh, Madhav Menon, used to say that, you know, we lawyers are social engineers. And I, for one, took it very seriously, the concept of social engineering. And that was quite inspiring because, uh, you know, we said uh, that, Chalo, we are engineers. Of course, engineers did a lot of ragging in Karnataka. So we did the ragging part. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on a serious note, as social engineers, uh, we actually felt uh, a wider, a, a larger role and we really, and of course, National Law School was yet to be tested. I was the fourth batch. Even the five batches were not complete. So we were an unknown product in the market. It was a big risk people were taking. The other option was for me to go to Delhi and try my luck in Stephens or Hindu or someplace. But instead, we are going to this unknown entity in Bangalore. And uh, uh, But at the same time, it was filled with possibilities mm -hmm. and there was no parameter and there was no pressure that you have to uh, get into this firm or you have to get into that place in fact i can share with you a very interesting uh, uh, anecdote uh, our uh, our batch was the first batch with this, with, which did campus interview and uh, that's the batch of 1996 and actually amarchand at that time there was no uh, the partition was not there sam and cam and uh, Cyril Amarchand, uh, uh, Mr. Cyril Shroff had come down along with his team. And I remember that uh, what they did was they actually gave uh, uh, a, a problem and said that it was a complex, some SEBI issue. And uh, they said, we are giving you pen and paper and we are putting you into a room. You are given half an hour, you write the answer and we will select on the answer. In fact, I went into the room and I came out in one minute and said, here's my answer paper and left. And you won't believe it, by the evening, I had the partner uh, of Amar Chan sending me a message through his junior that, please, we are offering your job. Join us right now. Wow. And, and uh, of course, you'll be curious to know what I wrote in that one minute. And I just wrote this. Of course, I had no clue of the answer. So I simply wrote in the National Law School, we are not wow. encouraged to con by rote. We are not encouraged to mug. You give us an access to a library and I promise you will have your answer. And wow. that's it. That one sentence I wrote and ran away. Oh, wow. <laughs> That requires so, a lot of courage. Oh my God. <laughs> courage or again, uh, you know, we were fools. We had, no, <laughs> we had no pressure because, you know, it's not that, oh, you know, there are so many batches and we have to get into our So, uh, you know, it was like that. So uh, it, it's, it's, the, it, it's, you know, the first generation or, you know, I would like to consider myself the first generation, the first five or the first generation. It has this pioneer advantage and pioneer disadvantages also. Right. Sir, so again, I was reading another interview of yours where you wrote that uh, right after law school, you joined 
a firm which paid well and that was like the obvious choice given that you were a first generation lawyer with no godfather in the profession and you also wrote that soon after you were uh, disenchanted with that job and you quit so what happened in that firm what made you realize that a uh, firm job is perhaps not meant for you for starters uh, uh, you know uh, that firm other it was an american firm and they were starting off in bangalore so they hardly had any work in bangalore but they had a lot of money so right. they wanted to hire lawyers to show that we have lawyers but they had no work so for starters there was hardly any work and you don't want to start off your legal journey by just doing nothing sitting in, uh, in the office the whole day and just uh, you know doing uh, you know minimal work or just formatting and stuff like that and of course uh, uh, now i must confess the book that you showed is a, is a little autobiographical so uh, the, my experience was exactly the experience which gorango had in that law firm uh, in that uh, in that consulting firm and and i ran away because i realized that uh, this is not what i want to do so this is very important for everyone to understand especially young law students that give yourself an opportunity to do everything but at the same time you will your your you, something inside will tell you this is what i this is for me like when i joined litigation in 1997 is within a year till date in 2022 and don't count and find out how old i am <laughs> but till date i have not had a single day where i have regretted or questioned my decision to be a lawyer that this is it and you will get it and not everyone has to be a litigator you can be a, a, a corporate lawyer you can be a uh, you can be um, a filmmaker we have had, we ha we have a law school in the alum uh, who's actually set up a bookshop in goa so you know you follow your dream do whatever you want some people are are, are become judges some people have become uh, i in the ias or ips uh, but you will know your inside will tell you that this is what i want to do sir i want to dig in a little oh sure, sure go ahead so you were saying something no 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 i was saying so so therefore in the i realized that i am you know i am not meant to be this uh, corporate type i'm not judging a corporate client but uh, you know, a corporate kind of work but uh, this law firm sitting uh, i realized that arguing in court passionately uh, researching the law uh, ha you know having your arguments appreciated in court uh, clients in court or other litigants in court admiring uh, your skill is what uh, uh, was driving me and that's what i did <laughs> at the earliest possible opportunity and that's wonderful sir sir staying on the topic of litigation i've often heard from uh, people that uh, are corporate lawyers even real lawyers <laughs> what do you think about that now don't get me into trouble <laughs> 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 but you know uh, you know it, it, it's again the problem with any generalization so mm. uh, there are good lawyers in corporate and there are you know are they lawyers type in the corporate it's the same with litigation let's not think the litigation is the holy cow <laughs> so there are so many people in litigation who are engage in such unethical practices or such questionable uh, practices um, or there are so many lawyers who are so called litigators only on social media Thank and you. you will find that they are following in thousands on social media but actually in reality they are nothing they do nothing they are not even uh, uh, given that kind of uh, you know uh, seriousness by courts because uh, they are not regular practitioners so uh, you know it's it's not fair to generalize and say Thank corporate you. lawyers are not lawyers and litigators are real lawyers it's uh, it's it's very individual absolutely i agree with you now sir i have a question when you decided to leave that firm job and enter into litigation like you said the money in that firm was obviously very good and as a first generation lawyer litigation can be a tricky space which we'll of course talk more about so was it i mean in your mind was there ever a worry that what if it doesn't work out what will happen to me because i think this is important i feel a lot of people who are watching this might be in a similar position maybe you're thinking of transitioning into litigation but uh, have student loans to pay and therefore are kind of tied to the place they, where they are for the money that it pays what's your what was your thinking back then when you decided to quit and enter litigation well uh sartak if i answer that i'll tell you that people of our generation are very different from the, uh, your generation right uh, i just had a, i just filled a vacancy in my office and i interviewed around 10 people and i realized that i was being interviewed rather than me interviewing so one of them even said that what are my uh, prospects after i leave you in two years <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> some of the work ethics in this place so things are improving young lawyers have are, are getting the courage and why not to ask seniors exactly what are, what they are getting uh, but uh, the uh, 
but to you know come back to your point about the first generation lawyer and this issue my parents actually had a heart attack because they just couldn't they could imagine me uh you know leaving a, a job which was such a high paying job and uh, just a year back they had you know bragged to all their relatives that our son is in bangalore is earning this that and then overnight to become a litigator with a salary of 5000 which was also on the higher side because in yeah. calcutta 400 or something 4 500 rupees and that is where the you know that is where it's a serious thing and you know we can't beat around the bush uh, this system this legal system however much we want to sugarcoat this this legal system is very difficult for a first generation lawyer it is actually completely programmed to ensure the status quo it, to ensure that the you know the same all same all happens for a lawyer who is the son or daughter of a sitting judge or a retired judge or a senior lawyer or a lawyer uh, it's so easy you have your practice there you have your father's chamber you have a clientele you have the uncles judges and auntie judges for a first generation it's very difficult and especially if a first generation lawyer is uh, is coming into and trying to break into this very very um, uh, oligarchic uh, uh, system and there's no uh, and there's no way of sugarcoating this it's very difficult imagine let's take an example in today let us say in litigation in the delhi high court a litigator is expecting a, st a starting salary of 20 to 25000 rupees now honestly think the student loan of 7 lakhs a cell phone bill of 500 rupees your auto or bus bill of five six hundred rupees. Your uh, uh, your rent of minimum ten thousand. And I'm I'm giving you all on the lower side. Right. How do you expect a lawyer with dignity to work at ten twenty five thousand rupees? And the difficulty is that this pattern seems to have been set. And uh, you know, if you are going to uh, give even higher salaries, it it disturbs the the, the structure. The exploitative structure is already there. Right. And uh, you know, someone has to do something about it. And unfortunately, our bar, the issues, the bar associations, the way they are, the young lawyers are only seen as votes, you know, to go and give votes or to campaign for their seniors to get votes. The bar will never talk about the young lawyers, will never take up the issues of um, um, of minimum guaranteed income for uh, young entrants or how uh, to deal with this issue. So yes, it becomes a very, very difficult uh, uh, choice, especially for a first generation person coming to a new city without a house, without relatives. I was lucky I came to Delhi and I had my grandmother. So, you know, the boarding, lodging, everything was free. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to manage with a salary of 5,000, though 5,000 was also a princely sum in 1997 when I came to Delhi. Right. But it's, it is a challenge. It is really a challenge. So what would your advice be to someone who's watching this and is not from Delhi? Like you said, I mean, I'm from Delhi, so I obviously don't have to pay rent should I choose to enter right. litigation. But for people, let's say, coming from places like UP, Rajasthan, Jharkhand, who want to litigate here in Delhi, given that the Supreme Court's here and the litigation culture is flourishing here, how how do you suggest that someone like that who dreams of lit being a litigator in Delhi should survive? Are there some ways or strategies that they could adopt? Okay, for starters, I may sound quite hypocritical having myself come and enjoyed the fruits of a big city. But recently, and I tweeted about this also, uh, uh, two year, a year or two back, this young lawyer through Twitter reached out to me and wanted to come and meet me. <clears throat> and he's from Meerut. And he came and he said, sir, I wanted your advice on one thing. Should I shift practice to Delhi or should I work in Meerut? Mm -hmm. And my answer to him was that, no, you will be one of the many in a big city but with your skill set, you are going to be a rock star in your local place. So my first advice will be, and again, as I said, it's with the caveat that yes, I made the mistake or whatever, I came here. But my first advice would be that, see, why do you have to come to Delhi? If you are able to make it in your small uh, or smaller city or uh, uh, tier two city, be it Chandigarh or Kanpur or Meerut or Bhopal, try that. Because trust me, or come for some time to, to a Supreme Court in Delhi and get that experience, but go back and build your, your reputation, build your clientele, build your practice in these small places, because it'll be far easier 
for you to do so, not only financially because you'll be at home, but also competition wise in the places that you're doing. And, uh, and this has been proven through many of the national law school uh, students who actually chose not to come to the metros to litigate, but actually litigated in their own uh, home high courts like Chandigarh, uh, uh, Hyderabad, etc., have done very, very phenomenal. And 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 I may add, uh, uh, coach, uh, coaching yeah. have done phenomenally well. So my first advice will be that make a informed decision whether you really need to come to Bombay or Delhi, or whether you can. Um, uh, consider the possibility of actually trying to do it in your own hometown. Right. So moving on, uh, of course, you joined the chambers of senior advocate Indra Jaising, ma'am, after your law firm stint. Now, what is your suggestion to people on choosing the right chamber, given that you have had now several years of experience in litigation? And I feel that the first chamber that a person joins as a litigator can have a huge impact on his or her thinking about the profession. So how do you suggest one should go about a fresh graduate in selecting a chamber to litigate or and learn under? See, fortunately or unfortunately, the in the present day, uh, the chamber where you start off as a young 25-year-old, 26-year-old is always kept in mind, even 20 years later, uh, while considering whether that person should be made a judge Mm -hmm. or that person should be given a, uh, a government posting. Uh, and that economy is ridiculous. And many, uh, many competent lawyers have been lost to the bench uh, on that ground that, you know, their senior was someone who is today considered controversial. Yeah. Uh, so if, so uh, if you really uh, are thinking long term, then of course you must keep that in mind. But remember that no one knows the, the, the senior you choose today who's non-controversial and the senior to work with may 20 years later turn out to be very controversial. So I would, <laughs> I would recommend that you should go by what inspires you. If the senior is someone whose work inspires you, all these things are irrelevant uh, as to you know, how that senior is perceived or not perceived. What you have to see are two things. One is the senior's work and the senior's work culture in the chamber. So these are the only, only two things which economy should matter to you uh, while deciding uh, on the office that you pick. Other considerations are absolutely immaterial. The senior's personal life, the senior's political life, these are all irrelevant according to me. But of course, in this day and age, everything is relevant. So you know, I'm caveating what I said by contextualizing it to the present day. Right. So on the practical side of it, I'm in my final year right now. And I'd like to share some of the worries that my batchmates have with regard to joining a chamber. And I'd love to get your insights on that. Some oh. feel that if they join like a mega super senior, uh, perhaps the kind of attention they'll get and the mentorship they'll get might not be a lot, but they'll have a tag of having worked with a designated ultra super senior. The second worry is that if they join another designated senior advocate, like a young designated senior, Again, they'll lose out on learning how to draft, given that senior a senior's job is essentially to argue in court. And then they fear that if they choose a non-designated but an otherwise flourishing lawyer, uh, they feel that if they want to set up an arguing counsel practice in the future, that might be a little troublesome. So given all these uh, questions, how do you suggest that in, in, in the long term to learn the necessary skill sets in litigation, what's the right kind of chamber to look for? Well, let me again say this is a sign of age when we start with any sentence or any comment with Hamare Zamane Me, that means actually you're old. <laughs> and let me tell you, and I'm sharing this with you because and I and I want your young viewers to also uh, contemplate on this. Uh, not everything about law is good. As I said, this whole oligarchy thing is not good. But law also has a long gestation, at least litigation has. And I don't know, the jury is still out whether it's good or bad. And what actually I find shocking amongst youngsters today is this whole desire, this maddening desire. And, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't be judging. Maybe the pressures are completely different today as, as opposed to what it was you know, for us 26 years ago. But this maddening desire to make it instantly, to have your own clients within six months, um, uh, to learn everything. You know, Someone came to me and said, sir, I want a job. So I said, but you just joined... 
uh, this uh, person uh, in February and now we're in November. Why do you want a job now? The person said, I've learned everything I need to learn about the trial court. Now I want to come to the high court. And for me, that is really shocking coming to me. Of course, I was also maybe an extreme, but I worked with my senior for six years. I never opened my mouth in court for five, for four years. For four wow. years, I just went around uh, doing the job of a junior of an arguing senior advocate. And I don't feel in any way that I have been deprived. In, on the contrary, it's honed your skill. You learn so much observing a senior advocate, uh, your senior, uh, in some cases, I joke in my case of not only things to do, but not, what not to do, because <laughs> my senior was also very controversial. So <laughs> you also learn what not to do. Right. Um, so uh, I, I really, my advice to your young uh, viewers would be that please don't be in a hurry. Mm. This, if you want to be in litigation, this is a profession with no retirement age. Right. Okay. So do you can you imagine? So there's no retirement age. Don't be in a hurry. You cannot learn everything in six months. You must give yourself some time. You must have patience. So there are various ways of starting. You can start by first going to the Supreme Court, do a stint for one or two years, then go back to your local high court or go to the trial court. Each person will have his or her own career path. Yeah. And the, the honest, God honest truth is that there is no one size fits all one, you know, one shoe for everyone. Your life, your destiny is your own. The only thing which is a requisite and which is uniform in litigation is you must be ready for hard work. Hmm. And you must not have any kind of, uh, you know, mental block that this is not my work. If my senior is arguing and he or she <laughs> is coughing, if you have to rush and get a bottle of water, don't feel that, oh God, I'm a lawyer. I've studied for five years. What is this? This is not my job. No. That should not be your uh, mindset. So after having worked with your senior for a few years, when did you decide to finally branch out? And how did you realize now is the opportune moment for me to finally set shop myself? You know, again, destiny, I, I, I am one of the worst things about me or maybe good things about me is that I really have no ambition. <laughs> and without having ambition, God has been kind. I have, I have, I have moved here, you know, some, you know, down the line somewhere God has taken me. And, and the, one of the things is this whole thing of status quo. I just love status quo. And unless koi dhakka dekhe mujhe, <laughs> you know, like for example, I joined, I never wanted to be a government lawyer. I had a decent practice. I said, chalo, chhe mahine ke liye kar lete hai. And I ended up, you know, being a government lawyer for six years. Wow. <laughs> so, so that, yeah. Uh, so that's the thing. Uh, when you realize you, for me in everything in my life has come late or my realization has come late. Maybe one or two years before I could have I could have applied for designation to become a senior. Maybe one or two years before I left my senior, I could have started off my own. But I'm not complaining. You know, as they say, destiny, whatever has to happen, it has to happen when it will happen. You realize, you realize that, you know, it is a question of that courage. It's mm -hmm. the leap. Can you take that leap? That leap also, you know, will come to you at various stages. Like, for example, uh, this applying for a senior and uh, getting designated and I got designated in the middle of the pandemic yeah. it's it's a big risk because you actually go back to zero so you build your practice because coming into independent practice is a big risk because your fixed income is gone it's all dependent on your clients your networking or your abilities then when you become a senior again the whole the whole uh, uh, grammar changes because again you're back to zero because it's like, you know, that Ludo where you have the snake, which brings you back from 99 to zero, you come to zero, you start again, and you have to establish your credentials as a senior as to whether lawyers will entrust their clients brief to you. So that also is a leap of faith. So at every stage, all that you need is the courage to take that leap of faith, the courage to decide to be a litigator, the courage to decide when to move out, the courage to uh, decide when to, you know, take on path A or path B or whatever comes your way. And I think, sir, this again ties to the fact that a lawyer is always a struggling lawyer, no matter <laughs> which position. Yes, yes. <laughs> <they need. laughs> so, so when, when you branch out as an independent practitioner, like you said, that steady stream of monthly income goes away and you now have to build your own clientele. 
and in a profession as a first generation lawyer where you don't have references where people don't know you how do you start building a steady set of clients that can bring you work how does that process begin that's a very important question and uh, one of the reasons why i really thought i was programmed for failure is because my complete inability to network uh, there are many people uh, who have benefited from the national law school nlu network and it's a big thing you know it's everyone knows about this that you have these nlus and they keep referring to each other their alumni i had a very very um unfortunate exit with my alumni um and i at that time decided that i don't want to have anything to do with the nlu uh, you know this whole cabal this whole network yeah so it it becomes all the more difficult and uh, but this is where uh merit and hard work which i was telling you about plays a crucial role so those lawyers who would come to brief my senior who would see my dedication in preparing notes for her in uh, in briefing her were the ones who actually started coming and giving me work yeah. because obviously my work would also have been involved filing would involve uh, because i you know i was just a, a law, uh, not a senior advocate i was a lawyer i, was, I could do everything file vakalat nama's draft appear in small big cases so so it is you know when you are being uh, meritocratic when you are being hard working you are noticed and merit pays maybe it takes time maybe it is not as much as uh, being born with a silver uh, uh, you know spoon in your mouth but ultimately if you are hard working you will be recognized you will be noticed and i keep saying that in this profession there is space under the sun for everyone you don't have to be in the rat race you don't have to uh, be insecure that oh hamara kya hoga there's enough enough and enough and more for everyone right now sir as a solo practitioner i'm sure there must have been a moment where you felt that ha ab i'm becoming stable it's going well for me was there a thing for you and where you felt like yes litigation is working out for me in terms of the client in terms of the money you could bring in to your own practice yes uh, you know again uh, i keep saying that so now you have seniors who uh, charge 25 30 40 50 1 crore a hearing and you know i keep joking that you know in the day if you make let's say 80 lakhs and as opposed to a person who's made let's say 8000 in a day in a day i'm not even talking about month or week in a day tell me will the dal and the chawal that you will have taste differently it won't no it's the same right. <laughs> you won't be having diamonds for dinner right so at the end at the end of the day it uh, the question that you asked is very individualistic at what time do you feel satisfied yeah well as i said i was not ambitious and i was very yeah. happy with status quo so i will always satisfied right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really nice of you to say so So no, honestly, I, I, this is not a Miss a Miss India type of answer. I really yeah. mean it. I never said that. Oh, you know, if the day I earn this much, that is the day I'll say that. Okay, I've made it. Hmm. Even now, you know, it's. Uh, I I'm very thankful, and this is the. And as a litigator, if you follow this, you are programmed to be peaceful. Take each day as it comes. Don't think ahead for twenty days, twenty five days, twenty years. Today, are you okay? Today, are you okay? have you uh, you know have you worked to take care of your needs to keep your mind occupied for the day and that is enough and you see it will uh, it will replicate and multiply right now sir on litigation i've often heard people say that if you know you're starting out as a litigator in delhi you need to have your office in a certain place you need to have your you need to <laughs> defense <drive a> colony <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> so and, and i mean the argument is that only if you have those things can you attract the right kind of clients to what extent are these perceptions true sir one of the i would say one of the greatest judges we have in the country today um and who was a very good lawyer and i hope post post retirement he'll also join the bar uh justice mulidhar his office was the back side of his blue maruti van in the supreme court parking lot right. i think i've answered your question <laughs> absolutely sir you know absolutely 
Sir, moving on again, and I think this is a very important question, given that, I mean, you are from National Law School, and we talked about how National Law Schools might have their own network, and that might help the first generation lawyers who ultimately end up going to these law schools. But the reality is that over 90% of people who become lawyers are not graduates of NLUs. NLUs taken only a handful of students. So in this profession, in litigation, does where a person went to law school matter? See, ultimately, even, you know, this question is also asked with regard to masters, whether an LLM degree matters or not. So I'll answer both of them, assuming that this would also be your question. Yeah. See, at the end of the day, all of these things, like your class 10 results or your class 12 results or your whatever you get in uh, your degree, these are all threshold issues. So ultimately, it is only, you know, that it is it will take you Okay, maybe if you have an NLU degree, it will open one door more than it will open you open for a non-NLU degree. But at the end of the day, it is only how you perform and how you uh, uh, you know how you uh, are able to establish yourself that really matters. When you are arguing a matter, the court, no one is going to ask you mm-hmm. NLU se hai ki nahi. I I I really uh, you know despite the fact that you know it's been twenty two years I have. I have seen, um, uh, you know, in uh, in NCLAT ka kitna hua? five, six years, seven years, NCLAT, that, uh, that common entrance exam and all started. But I still don't, I have not seen any client who actually seeing a lawyer argue, ask, ye sa university se pass out hai? Yeah. No, I don't think so. So at the end of the day, you know, and my senior taught me a very important thing. And this should be a mantra for all litigators. You are as good as your last order. <laughs> so you get a good order, you come from the Sarak Chab Law School, the client will kiss your hands. <laughs> and you come from NLS and you dismiss the client's case, the client will not say, oh, achha, teko, NLS se aaya hai, to kya hua, hamare client case ko dismiss kara diya. So you, you, yeah. you get what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. At the end of the day, it's, the, it's it, in, the, in the litigation and client is our God, is our Lakshmi. For the client, only and only the order matters. Absolutely. Now, sir, when a junior joins a senior's chamber to learn the profession, for instance, I mean, you're now a senior. I'm sure you have many juniors. You've had had several juniors over the years. What are your expectations from the people who join you? Because as a fresher, a person can only know so much about the law. So what are your expectations from your associates? And what do you think when an associate joins a chamber should be his or her expectations? The same expectation which I wrote out in that answer sheet to Amar Chan. <laughs> I don't expect and I never interviewed. I have over years interviewed so many young graduates or young lawyers with one or two years of practice. I have never asked them what is section so and so of this act or section so and so of this code. That is not the way you actually assess someone. So at the end of the day, whoever is coming into my chamber or in, you know in litigation, must have the ability or the willingness to learn, the willingness to uh, to strive and be hardworking. And uh, for example, someone applied to my office and said, what are the work hours like? And I said, ma'am, do you do litigation? Because if you do litigation, you will be not asking this question. What are the work hours like? There are no work hours for a litigator. Right. So at the end of the day, what is what, I, what we are looking for is someone who will uh, be good in research skills or at least willing to improve the research skills and hardworking. That's all that you need. Um, The rest is all, uh, you know, why do we say the word practice, legal Mm. practice? Because we are all practicing and, you know, there's never, you can never say that I have reached a point where I've learned everything. Even today, after, you know, 26 years in practice, I can't say, okay, I have learned everything. I can I, I would sit in court and observe even young lawyers and say, okay, that's a good technique. I have learned something new today. And this is another thing I want to share. And I'm sounding too much like a dadaji today. No, no. But a lot of uh, uh, young lawyers, even interns, when they come to courts, they uh, they would rather spend the time outside in the corridor chatting or you know uh, you know catching up. Their internship kaise hai, mere internship kaise hai, <laughs> or, or going to the canteen and trying to have biryani and bun samosas or whatever. But, you know, it is important to actually be in court, even for not your matters, to see how others are arguing, to see how judges are reacting, to see how lawyers are managing 
to deal with difficult situations of a judge or turning around the uh, a case and you learn so much and in fact i always of course now when you when you practice in our home turf which is the high court we know the judges so there's not much at my age to go into a courtroom and actually learn yeah but even now when i for example i went to the himachal high high court uh, last uh, two weeks back i went to chandigarh so even now when i go i went to orissa high court so so when i when you go to new courts i always prefer to actually sit in on the court and listen to the judge in cases which are not mine to mm. get an assessment of how the court is so i would advise young lawyers to do that and now you have vcs just log in when you have free time log in and see how court proceedings are you are you, you are so blessed you can actually now uh, be video streamed and watch uh, live streaming of constitution bench uh, hearings yeah. please uh, please exploit them this is historic imagine if we had access to uh, archived uh, uh, filmed uh, keshwananda bharati hearings yeah. see the great nani palki wala argue or uh, you know minarva mills i mean it's uh, just ak gopalan just imagine how it would be absolutely and thank you so much for being so honest about that answer sir now sir as a law student i'd like to ask a question on behalf of all fellow interns because otherwise this is a common question that i generally ask all the litigators who are on the show what is your opinion on unpaid internships well at the end of the day uh, you know uh, this is a you know you you is an lbw you've got for me because i don't have paid internships at best what i do is i gift the intern a book uh, mm. or something at the end of the internship but uh, i i i really don't know what parameters uh, to uh, to uh, apply to an internship in fact i may be very honest and share with you in 99% of the internships that i have had i've actually found very rarely maybe uh, out of 100 maybe maybe you know not more than 5% where the interns have actually contributed to the uh, to the office in any meaningful manner it was more the other way around where you are hand holding right. so in circumstances now if you want to be paid for hand holding that's a different matter of course the view is different when it comes to a a lawyer you know there are chambers where they make lawyers work for free and and not in my chamber Uh, a lawyer is made to work for free that is completely un- uh, unacceptable but with an intern i seem to have a different view so it's you know it's it's almost like an internship is like let us say a summer school mm. so to expect to be paid for that uh, i would say is um, is difficult is uh, is something which you know i i am as of now I'm not very uh, sure on but of course at the same time if there are interns who are coming into a city uh from outside and spending money on 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 staying and transport and all that is something which i think we should all look into and i'm thankful to you for flagging this i will actually contemplate on this right and so moving on so for someone who is a litigator uh, many would want to eventually be designated as a senior counsel for those interested in the arguing side of it so how do you suggest that a person who has gone independent structure their a uh, practice and career in a way that maybe 10 20 years down the line they will be in a place where they can apply for being designated as a senior or should you or do you feel that people should just take cases as they come and if they do it well uh, the senior designation will follow what is impressive of this generation and as articulated by you is sitting in the last year of law school you're thinking of when you will become senior and how to work <laughs> for it we never even thought of all these things then <laughs> but but uh, uh, you know on a serious note uh, you know at the end of the day uh, this 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 uh, thing which our professor told us in the last year of law school or rather the last trimester or maybe the last weeks of law school he said that uh, you know what will you practice which law will you practice and someone put put his hand up and said i'll do um, criminal law someone said i'll do labor law i will do intellectual property laws and ultimately said you are fools because you will practice that law which your client brings to you right. and that is so true i mean my becoming uh, before i be, before i became a government standing counsel my actually specializing in labor and employment was a complete accident it's just that you know i was looking for an uh, for a break and there was this labor lawyer who was looking for a law, uh, for a uh, for 
someone in the high court to argue his cases and that's how i did labor law yeah. so that's exactly what i'm trying to say that you know these are all uh, uncertainties which you can't plan today you may set up from law school thinking that i will be this 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 but life is very very uncertain my friend and you never know what life has in store for you so right. whether to plan to be a judge or to be a senior advocate what do you have to do uh well i won't say that people don't do that many people do plan that way <laughs> but people in the zone of consideration for senior of course people say that you uh, you know now with the indira jaising versus registrar supreme court the ju judgment on senior designation it has laid down several uh, guidelines one of them is uh, publications uh, right. uh, two is pro bono work three is uh, um, appearing and arguing landmark cases so obviously you have to focus on these things um, pro, pro bono work as and and publication of your articles so these are two things which you have to uh, practice, uh, follow and even if you're interested in judiciary uh, these are very important uh, where you uh, where you concentrate on publication of your articles and also doing uh, you know work of a public nature right absolutely now sir i i want to ask something that i've been thinking about a lot actually we are all aware of the problems that fresh young lawyers face uh, those are pretty well documented but are there some challenges that you faced when you became a designated senior like you said that the steady clients that you had were now no longer yours because you had to be briefed so you had to find ways to you know counsels had to brief you so that you could argue those matters and in a way you had to start out again so Correct. what are the kind of challenges that a newly designated senior counsel faces that's a very good question um, and let me answer that right away so there are two a traditional senior is a senior who only appears in court a senior uh, an, an instructing lawyer a solicitor comes to you with a brief you don't interact with the client you don't do drafting and you um, just interact with the lawyers and you brief your brief till you go to court but unfortunately many seniors all over the country uh, uh, what they do when they become designated seniors is they actually continue the same practice but it's just that they are filing you know they get their juniors to file they draft along with the juniors junior apne office ka junior file karte and then they appear as seniors and argue the case which we call chamber practice mm -hmm. that is technically not actually the traditional senior role so i was very clear from the beginning that when i became a senior i'm not going to do a chamber practice and i'm going to uh, you know be a, a a traditional senior that i have to get rid of my clients i have to tell them go find lawyers uh, and i will only i will not take on clients directly and so the and this is very important you must understand that you have been tested out as a lawyer for let's say 20 years 25 years and then you are coming into as a senior now as a senior you are a completely unknown entity right okay so therefore again you're a product okay so uh, I, i know i'm being brutal but it's 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 as you know it's the marketing thing that all of a sudden there's a new product in the market a new cola you know people already having fanta or 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 <laughs> thumbs up or uh, you know coke now why would why would they want this new cola and so therefore that's the whole thing so the the advocate on record who wants to brief you will have to understand why you why should you now change this maybe for a different taste maybe because it's cheaper so there are so many things okay. so that that's how they, so therefore the challenge is this that you have to now be a completely different product a marketable product and let's be very clear as a senior you have to deliver you have to get the orders for the clients you have to uh the client must see a uh, client for you your client of course is the instructing lawyer the instructing lawyer must see that you are getting that respect that accommodation from the court if the court is treating you as a aaja kon aaye hai whatever then they'll say that what's the point of hiring a senior counsel yeah. so it's only when the court is giving you that respect is giving you that uh, regard the the lawyer feels chalo you know i have engaged a senior so i'm getting a hearing i'm getting that kind of attention so these are the challenges now all this so normally they say for uh, for a senior it takes after designation a good 6 7 months to even find their feet so many people actually sit jobless after having a very you know um i'm not talking about the chamber seniors the real seniors who actually uh, you know the traditional seniors so all of a sudden when you become a senior your workload goes because then slowly slowly you have Oh, you know two cases a week or three cases then four then every day one then every day two so it increases like that 
now the, now think of this now this is during normal times i was designated in the middle of a pandemic so you know here, here again you are only appearing through vc no one is seeing you there is no opportunity for people to reach out to you also i was a government lawyer for 6 years before designation so the private sector had no opportunity to interact with me there are many people who were already working uh, as uh, you know arguing as seen though not designated seniors but they were arguing as senior lawyers they had the network they had the relations with the briefing lawyers but for me as a government lawyer all of a sudden to straight away become a private senior counsel was was challenging and lastly the challenge was the kind of work i was doing so i was doing all these labor cases and of course uh, my heart broke when i had to tell many of those clients that see i can't be a lawyer anymore you'll have to hire a lawyer and you know many of them i was doing the case for 2000 rupees for the whole case just out of a sense of charity now it is cruel for me i can do the charity for 2000 but to send them to some other lawyer and say that you know this uh, poor workman has paid me 2000 rupees in 19 uh, uh, to 2006 and now in 2022 i'm sending him to you to do his case free it's very difficult Uh, so these are the challenges, but I must say that God has been kind. I've survived. <laughs> right. The struggle carries on. <laughs> struggle carries on. Right, sir. Another thing that I often keep thinking about is that it's quite possible that in litigation, one may have stretches of bad days. You know, where one might not be getting favorable orders, or one gets reprimanded in court, someone passes a. a uh, nasty comment and and as young lawyers these can be major setbacks uh, yes. how do you deal with them how did you deal with them when you were young and how do you deal with them now uh, what's your advice to the viewers well i must admit i still get butterflies after so many years when i appear in a case and i still get the uh, the high when i get a good order or when the judge is kind and i still get the lows when the judge doesn't Uh, uh rule as i would like uh, the judge to rule but again uh, you know that's something which you have to accept now it's like when you go to drive yeah. if you are scared that you will hit your car in delhi you are bound to hit and scratch your car okay but if <laughs> because of that fear you don't drive then you are the loser so similarly in uh, there are many judges uh, let me tell you many judges are extremely kind to young lawyers they encourage young lawyers and uh, they are um, indulgent uh, and they appreciate when young lawyers argue very well so uh, my advice to all of you will be that the same advice i would give to myself and others in driving when you have your first accident if you go to the car, put the car in the garage and say i'm not going to come out again don't do that next morning again take the car out and go and that's how you will lose your fear of driving and that's how you will understand that this is a part of life in every case there'll only be two three things winning losing or adjournments <laughs> <laughs> but that's very well said sir so so i'll quickly come to the final set of questions uh now i know for a fact sir that you read a lot i keep following your twitter for recommendations you obviously have your litigation practice you know your practice as a lawyer and then you have other interests that you follow how do you regulate your time because litigation like you said earlier doesn't have any working hours so in that busy schedule how does one regulate their time and try to squeeze in a little time for maybe reading a book or going for a walk or spending time with friends and family you know I, before my designation i should actually bring a book to court and read a book and i became quite infamous and many one or two lawyers and even senior advocates started copying that by bringing a book to court and reading and uh, then when i was designated i was told by my uh, my friends that you know if you come to court with a book people will think ye to jobless senior hai <laughs> <laughs> but you know you know that doesn't deter me so even now uh if i come to court and i know that there's a waiting time i get a book and i and i try to read of course my reading has been impacted because i've spent wasted so much time on social media i get tempted to uh be too much more than i should be uh also uh, you know you have netflix amazon and all these ott which also mm-hmm. uh take up your time so my reading has been impacted mm-hmm. but let me tell you one thing and this is what a book lover should do even if you are unable to read don't stop getting yourself a book second hand mm. book first hand book even if you get yourself or, or borrow from the library and keep it in your ha- house for uh, two weeks you never know even that you know uh, going through and uh, reading one or two pages uh, 
uh, you never know how that will uh, help you or open up your mind or give you ideas or, or stimulate you. So even if you can't read, don't stop uh, patronizing books. And that's very interesting. In fact, I think Naseem Talib in one of his books also said that possessing more unread books than read books is a sign of intelligence because it shows that one realizes how much he does not know. So that's really yes. interesting. Uh, and, now, and, sir, and, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, please go ahead, sir. You know, I, I, as Mahatma Gandhi had said, and I can't better the father of the nation, yeah. act as if you will die today and mm -hmm. act as if today is the last day of your life and read as if you will live forever. Oh, that's beautiful. So now, sir, I'll come to the final question. And this is a question that I ask all the guests who've been on the show. And since you're a book lover and you've also confessed that you watch a little bit of Netflix and Amazon, would you like to give us some recommendations? It could be books, it could be movies, it could be a song that you're listening to, anything that you feel our viewers might find interesting. Oh, I mean, uh, that I, I I can, you know, for example, I, I would say that all of you, there are certain books that you should read. One of them is the graphic novel Mouse. Mouse is means mouse in German, and it is uh, Arch Spiegelman's iconic graphic novel on the Holocaust. Mm. It's a must. The other, for all lawyers, is reading the cross examination of Oscar Wilde, the trials of Oscar Wilde. It's brilliant. Uh, you know the the two trials that he had. Uh, the other would be Partho Chatterjee's um, Princely Imposter. Uh, which has also come out as uh, the sannyasi and something poison or something like that. You can check. It's about the Bhaval Sanyasi's case. The Bhaval Sanyasi's case was the first, most important, longest uh, civil trial in in undivided India. And it's brilliant. That book is brilliant. It gives you all the nuances of the trial. So, you know, these are some books which um, are good. You must read Granville Austin's books. Uh, Working of a Democratic Constitution is a must. Uh, Nani Palkiwala's book is a must. Uh, the, the book on Nani Palkiwala by Arvind Datar is a must. The Rebel on Ramjit. I can go on and on. You have to stop me. <laughs> no, no, please, please go on. These book recommendations are fantastic. And our viewers <laughs> the, love rebel, the Rebel uh, on Ramjit Malani. I'm only giving law-related books. The, yeah. the Rebel uh, written uh, on, on the life of Ramjit Malani is also a page turner. Very, very interesting to read. What I was disappointed, let me also share the books I was disappointed with. Yeah, that's equally was, important. <laughs> yeah. I was very disappointed with Justice H.R. Karna's book, you know, Neither Roses Nor Thorns. It was written in a, of course, uh, uh, that's the traditional way H.R. Karna would write. I I don't think he was quite, uh, you know, as poetic and uh, as Justice Krishna here. Yeah. So that was something. And then, of course, uh, Andi Arjuna's uh, book on the Keshwan of the Bharati, I was very disappointed with because I expected that since he had a ringside view of Keshwan mm -hmm. the Bharati, we would have more nuggets and um, it would be uh, more fleshed out. Right. But, uh, of course, uh, it's historical, but um, it's not as, you know, as interesting as I would want them to be. But yes, I mean, these are, uh, you, you, again, books are very, very individual. Yeah. Uh, it depends on the taste. Some people like science fiction. Some people uh, like, um, uh, you know, war. Some people like historical uh, works. But for me, uh, in law, and, and law, let me tell you, is a very, very small aspect mm. of, uh, of this. And so far as movies are concerned, legal movies, you must watch that Tokyo Trials. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, brilliant uh, Irfan's uh, port portrayal of uh, Justice Radha Binodpal. Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, and of course, 12 Angry Men mm -hmm. is is another classic. Uh, the Hindi, I think, is called Ek Ruka Hua Faisla. So, uh, and even Court, that Marathi um, uh, right. movie, is, is one of the uh, amazing uh, portrayals of law. Don't watch Damini. Damini is not how it is. <laughs> P-A-L-L-B you can watch or Jolly LLB or whatever. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's a fun watch. Right. And I will also add how Gaurango lost his O to the list of books that people should <laughs> I read. Could not, I, I would be called a shameless self-promoter, so I did not say so. But no, yes, no, but... Listen, to Sarthak, listen to him. <laughs> it's a great book. And I'll tell you guys why. Because without going into the technicalities of law, this book tells you a lot about 
the certain terms of the profession and what the life of a lawyer can be and what the litigation process looks like in a very fun story kind of a format and you'll not find that anywhere else you'll find that only in how gaurango lost his o which is available everywhere so buy it right away and with this sir i think we can come to an end of today's thank conversation you, thank you sir it was great chatting with you and uh, uh, we must do it more often the pleasure was all mine thank you so much sir